Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second to last topic in BC. This is exciting. This is parametric equations and vectors. They go hand in hand with one another, so the video is going to cover both topics at once. Now, parametric equations are all about motion. So you might have seen something similar to this in physics when you're talking about kinematic motion. If not, when you do classes in college related to mechanical engineering or anything related to physics, you're going to see parametric motion. One thing, so again, the main reason for parametric equations is to describe motion because it gives you direction, not just a graph. Another thing it's nice for is because normally if we're talking about functions, it has to pass the vertical line test, which says that any vertical line can only hit the graph at most one time. So if you had something like this, obviously not a function, fails the VLT. Well, when you talk about parametrics and parametric equations, you can have curves that look like this that aren't graphs of functions. Now, the thing to remember with parametrics is there's not just x and y here. There is a third parameter here, t. So it's kind of like we needed 3D motion and it was x, y, and z. Here we're still in two dimensions, but we have an invisible third parameter time ticking away in the background. Now, let's say we have a typical graph of a parametric curve here. It's still on our normal 2D XY plane. Now, oftentimes when you graph a parametric or parametric equations, some books call the path here curve C. Um, the direction is going to be indicated by arrows, either right on the graph or with arrows right next to the graph. And then I'm going to show you how to graph a parametric curve here. But anytime you see parametrics, you're always going to have two equations. It's not just going to be y equals f of x. So your old notation with two parameters, y as a function of x, is gone. You now have to have two separate equations. Here is x as a function of the parameter t. So parametric equations, we have the parameter t. And then we have y of t, y as a function of the parameter t. Now, x of t gives you left and right motion on the x-axis. y of t gives you up and down motion on the y-axis. x and t together give you the whole graph, and the time tells you which direction it goes. You just follow the time in chronological order here. Now, one again, that's another way of saying as time increases, we see the direction of the motion, and we know the location for any time. Just keep in mind, you can always eliminate the parameter t and go back to y equals f of x. Or you can start with y equals x of f of x and go to parametric notation. You need to be able to do this one. You don't need to go from y equals f of x back to parameters, but you do need to go from parameters back to y equals f of x. So I'll show you how to do all that stuff in these videos. Um, I just realized I misspelled that. There should only be one R here for parametrics. Eek. All right. Uh, anyway, make sure you have all this stuff down because I'm going to move up. Now, vector representation is basically the same exact thing as parametrics, except we use a slightly different notation. Now, depending on your professor or your book in the future, you might use these arrows, not parentheses. They have to be arrows. Or you might use ij notation or i hat j hat, where i is horizontal back and forth and j is vertical up and down. So before, if you're talking about just parametric equations, they're always going to be written like this. If you really want to write these as a vector, vectors always talk about the x and the y, x comma y, like this. So all you do is you just take the x one and you put it here and you take the y one and you put it here. Same exact thing. Or you can take the x1, put in parentheses, put an i after. Take the y1, put in parentheses, put a j after. All of those you should be familiar with. The AP exam doesn't actually, the AP exam doesn't use ij anymore. It uses this bracket notation. And for vectors here, the symbol a, comma b represents a vector that stretches from the origin to the coordinate ab, head to tail. So it shows the direction of the motion. We're not going to go too much into vectors. You could do months on vectors. We're just going to do what you need to know for the exam. We're going to talk a little bit more with the parametric notation. Now, right here are the things you need to do on the AP exam. The AP exam, again, doesn't cover everything that has to do with parametrics, but these things you need to be able to do. So let's say you have a position vector x, y. So you have the x position and the y position. Together, they make the total position. Um, the, you have to find the velocity, 
the speed, which is magnitude of velocity, acceleration, distance traveled, and you have to be able to find slope still. I'm going to show you how to do each of these things quick. You should also know the following here. If dx dt is negative, the particle moves left. If dx dt is, par is positive, the particle moves right. dy dt tells you if it's moving up or down. Now, you do need to be able to find these two on the exam. Sometimes they'll say um, where the particle's position has a vertical or horizontal tangent line. They'll say where does that happen, and you'll have to be able to do that. And if both dx dt and dy dt are zero, the particle's not moving. So oftentimes they'll ask you where is the particle at rest. Now, I do not want you writing all this stuff down. I mean, if you really wanted to, I guess you could, but I'm going to give you a printout of this on colored paper so you can tape it with your notes. So wherever you are in your notebook, you might have used half a page so far. Leave the other half blank. Either way, you need about half a page to tape this in with these notes. So I'm going to start talking about parametrics and how they work. So that was just an overview of it. Let's talk about how this is actually going to play out. So let's say we're on a cliff that's 50 feet high and you're pushing a grocery cart off of it. You give it a push and at the moment it goes off the cliff, it's going 5 miles per hour. So this right here, we're going to split up the, cart, the cart's motion in x and y. So right here, left and right is x of t and then up and down is y of t. Again, in the background we have that parameter time ticking away and keep in mind that this guy is going five miles an hour left and right. What I'm going to do first is get equations for x and y. So again, the cart has a path that's going to look something like this. That much we know, but we want to split up this somewhat curved motion into x and y. So we're going to talk about them completely separately. So let's do x first. Now in the x direction, we're only talking about horizontal movement. So let's not think about gravity. Let's pretend it's not in effect right now. We're just thinking about the left and right motion here. So the position in general is equal to velocity times time. So for the x direction, it's going 5 miles an hour. That's the velocity times time t. Plus, I'm going to need to add to it the initial x position. Now the initial x position is 10 because I'm assuming that the cliff sticks out 10 meters from my origin spot right there. Now let's write y of t which is the up and down position of the graph. So this is like a physics formula here. We're not going to talk too much about that but let's just use it to get the equation. The y is going to be the initial y position which is 50 plus the initial velocity in the x direction. Now the second this cart goes off the cliff, it's only moving left and right. It's not like it's moving up and down at all, right at this moment, whenever time equals zero. So the initial velocity in the y direction is zero. I would have multiplied that by t, plus the acceleration due to gravity. Well, since we're on Earth here, the acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.80 meters per second squared, but we're gonna round here and make it negative 10 just so all of our computations are easier. So I'm going to make this 50 minus 10, and then you're going to have to multiply it by t squared over 2. And again, that is a physics formula here, and we're not going to derive it necessarily, but we did use it to get equations. So we have x and we have y. So what we're going to do is pl plot the cart's path using these two functions. And on the exam, you're going to need to be able to look at a parametric graph and sometimes have to plot it. So let's plot this here. Now, normally you pick x values and plug x in and get y values. Here, you're going to pick t values, plug t into both x and y to get the overall position at any time t. So let's see what happens during the first three seconds of this cart's path down a cliff here. So first let's plug in zero. If I plug zero in here, I have five times zero plus 10 is 10. And then plug zero in here, here's a simplified one. This zero is out, so I have 50. And that makes sense because initially I'm at 10 comma 50. So that's t equals zero. t equals one, I'm gonna plug one into here. Five times one plus 10 is 15. Plug t equals one into the y part of the position. That'd be 50 minus five, which is 45. So that means 20, 30, 40, we'll make that 30, and 10, 20, 30, 40. So after one second, the cart is now at 15, 
Ooh, 45. So there's t equals 1. I'm going to do the rest here. At t equals 2 seconds, we have 20, 30. And at t equals 3, oop, that should be a 3 right there. Eek. I have 25, 5. So every second, it moves down more and more. So this is the path of the cart. And then eventually, it's going to splat on the ground here. And this was for t equals 2 and t equals 3. So one good thing about parametric motion is it tells you the direction of the movement. You can actually see it. Now, obviously, for the cart, you know that it's not going to magically go up in the air like that. But in some cases, you won't really know the context of the situation. So you won't know, like if you have a curve like this. You won't know if it's supposed to go this way or this way. So a parametric motion always will tell you what direction it's going. For us here, since as time increases, it goes this way, this is clearly the direction of motion. Uh, now let me show you how to go back to y equals f of x notation. So here I split up the overall position into x and y. I wrote a parametric equations. Let's eliminate the parameter t and write it in normal function notation. So the way that works is... You need to pick one of the ver or one of the equations to solve for t. You should always pick the one where it's easier to get t alone. In this case, <clears throat> it's going to be way easier to get t alone in x. So I have, I'm going to get rid of x of t and just put x. Let's go ahead and solve for t. And then what we're going to do is plug it in to the other equation. And then it'll just be y equals f of x. So what I'm going to do is take this, plug it right into there. So then I have y equals 50 minus 5 times x minus 10 over 5 squared. Here what I did is I just broke up my fraction into two terms to make it easier to FOIL. Again, you do not just square each term here. You have to FOIL out and you get these three terms. I distributed my 5 to each term. So my final equation, y equals f of x now. Notice t is completely gone. I have wrote it in the old notation that you're more used to, I should say, is y equals this. Now, it makes sense that it's a parabola, or it's quadratic here, because our curve is a parabola. And right here, we just have one equation to represent the path, instead of needing two equations to represent the path. Now, you might be wondering, why don't we just go back to our old notation? Why do we need to split it up into parametrics? Because this is simpler. There's only one equation. The problem with this is... If you just have it in your y equals f of x notation, you lose information. Here's a summary of the things that you're going to lose if you go to y equals f of x notation. So like I said, you lose the direction here. It's very clear that as t increases, we're going this way, so I can put the arrows on it. If you are just given a random parabola, like this right here, you have no direction, you have no idea what the direction is. Like if you were to graph this, it would look something like this. Oh, wow. I realize I forgot a negative right here, so make sure you put that negative in. But anyway, if you plot this, it'll look something like this. You have no idea if it goes this way or this way. Also, you won't be able to answer questions like, where is the object after 5 seconds? Because this right here is y equals a function of x. It can't tell you anything about where we are on this path with respect to time. And in, usually in physics or applications, you, won't, you care about what happens with respect to time. So this only gives you where y is relative to x or where x is relative to y. These here tell you where you are on your graph at any time t, which is very helpful in physics. So in the next video, I'll show you examples of um, a couple types of questions you'll have to be able to answer.